So now we're going to do chapter 12, blood. So blood. Blood is a fluid tissue that has many kinds of chemicals that are actually dissolved in it and millions and millions upon cells floating around in it. Now blood itself also has very specific pH. Now this pH is very important to maintain homeostasis. This is the pH where these um, cells in the body are actually going to function at their best and if it gets outside of this pH range, your body won't function very well. And that pH range is 7.35 to 7.45. And Yes, I do think that that's important for you to know. And granted, that may be just because I'm a little partial to blood pH because in my job, we just, we use it all the time. But it's just so important um, to know about body pH and know if somebody's acidotic or alkalotic. Because if you are, it can make you really, really sick and can actually kill you. So, now going back to the purpose of this lecture, which is blood, your blood is actually comprised of a few different things. So, um, most of it is plasma. Plasma is that liquid portion of blood. And if you can see, so 91% um, of your plasma is actually water. And then 45% of your blood, so 55 is the plasma, 45% is actually the dissolved elements in it. Not really that they're dissolved, they're actually staying nice and formed. And those are your things like your platelets, your leukocytes, which are your white blood cells, and your erythrocytes, which are your red blood cells. So blood types. Blood types are um, identified by the antigens, which are located in your red blood cells. So this is on your red blood cell. So what is an antigen to begin with? An antigen is a protein that can stimulate the body to make an antibody. So an antigen just stimulates it to make an antibody. An antibody is a substance that is made in the body in response to the stimulation of an antigen. So antigens and antibodies work together, but they're not the same thing. An antigen stimulates the making of an antibody. And an antibody is basically um, what the body uses um, to attack something. So the antibody triggers that immune response to say, this is a foreigner, attack this. Um, and, and many antibodies can react with their antigen to actually um, agglutinate or, or clump together, which I'll get into a little bit more in a minute. So blood types first. So if you have blood type A, what that means is that you have the blood type A antigen and anti-B. So because you have the A antigen, you will recognize the A antigen on other red blood cells and know that that's normal. But if you see an antigen, that is not type A, you are going to say that is not normal and trigger antibodies. Where if you have blood type B, you will have the B antigen on your red blood cells, which means if you see the B antigen on other red blood cells, for your red blood cell sees it, it's going to say, oh, same antigen as me. I guess you're fine. Where if it sees a different type of antigen, like let's say it sees type A, a floating around, it's going to say you're type A, you don't belong here, and it will trigger an antibody response. Now if you have type A and B, that means that you have the antigens to both. So you can see the antigens to either both, just A or just B, and it's not going to trigger an immune response. You won't get an antibody response because either A or B, it's going to recognize as being part of itself, so it won't think that it's a foreigner. So that's called the universal recipient um, blood type, and that's because it doesn't matter what you give it, it's gonna be happy. Because it has the antigens for both A and B, you can give it type A, you can give it type B, you can give it type AB, or you can give it type O, which we'll get to in a second, and it's happy with all of them. So type O. Type O just has no antigens. So that means that if it sees type A, it's going to reform an immune response. And if it sees type B, it's going to form an immune response because it just knows neither one belong to it. But 
type O because it doesn't have any antigens is actually the universal donor. Because if I give type O to someone who has type B, type B, it's not going to spot an antigen that doesn't belong to itself because there isn't an antigen to be seen. So I can actually give type O blood to anybody else and it won't trigger an immune response in them because it doesn't have the antigen. So sometimes the question comes up where, well, if type O sees type B and it's going to trigger an immune response, then why can I give type O to somebody? And maybe their B cells won't trigger an immune reaction, but wouldn't my O cells trigger an immune reaction? And it doesn't because when we give blood to somebody, we've actually taken out um, their white blood cells that react. So it's not going to react in any way. It just doesn't have a receptor or an antigen on it to trigger a reaction in the other one. So I do think that that's important for you guys to know that type AB is the universal recipient because it has antigens for both A and B. And type O is the universal donor because it doesn't have any antigens. But the interesting thing about type O is that type O, in order to get a blood, um, a blood donor to it, has to be type O because I can't give it any of the other types or it's going to recognize those antigens and form an immune response to them. So here's this in kind of a visual form in case you are a visual learner and need to see the pictures, not just hear me explain it. So um, if you are a type O, you have no antigens, but you have anti-A and anti-B antibodies. So that means if I give you type O, you have nothing happen. If I give you type B, they're going to agglutinate. Remember how I said um, that the antibody reaction triggers agglutination? Well, that's when these red blood cells see they should normally be just kind of individual things. They actually start clumping together in your blood. So if you notice type O, type O getting it is fine, but anything else causes them to agglutinate or clump together. If I have type A, I can accept type O or type A, but type B or type AB makes my blood agglutinate or clump together. If I have type B, it means I can have type O because remember type O can, ex can be given to anything. It's the universal donor. But I can't get type A because it'll make my blood agglutinate or type AB because that A antigen is going to make my blood agglutinate. But I can get type B because that won't. It'll recognize type B as being its own antigen. And then type AB has no antibodies. It's not going to form an antibody to everything because it has an antigen to everything. So that's the universal recipient. You can give them anything and they're happy. So, um, so the other thing is um, if you've heard like the like blood type said, normally people say I'm like O negative or I'm AB positive. So what exactly does that mean? Well, the negative or positive actually refers to the RH system. So the RH system is actually this group of, of um, 50 different types of antigens. And the plus or negative actually refers to one very particular one. So if you're RH positive, it means that that antigen is found on your red blood cells. And if you're RH negative, it means that it's not. And that's what we mean if we say negative or positive, we just sort of drop the RH. So normally you have no anti-RH hormones or antibodies present um, naturally in your plasma. You'll have the antigen, but you don't have the antibodies. But what happens is that they appear in the plasma of a negative person if they get RH positive red blood cells introduced to their body. So I think I talked about this again on the next slide. Let me just double check. Nope, didn't. Um, okay, so what that really actually means is that like if I get a blood transfusion, 
and I'm RH negative and I get RH positive blood, the first time it's not really going to do that much. I'm going to make antibodies because I didn't have them to begin with. But the next time that it happens, I'm going to have a, an antibody reaction to it. I'm going to have an immune reaction because this time those antibodies say you don't belong here. Another time when this can be a problem is actually with childbirth. If an RH negative mom, and remember it has to be a negative mom, has a RH positive baby, so let's say dad was RH positive, so she has an RH positive baby, um, what can happen is that she can actually form antibodies because a little bit of their blood's going to mix, that's a little bit normal, um, just because they share a circulatory system, and she then forms the antibodies. Then let's say she has baby number two. Same thing, RH positive dad, RH positive baby, only this time she has antibodies. So her body actually attacks baby's body because she now has antibodies against the baby's blood type. So that's kind of where it becomes a problem. The, we'll talk about that more in the reproductive system. There's a little, little jumping ahead for you. That's just explaining the RH negative or RH positive. So it's just um, this RH... Um, antigen in the blood, positive means you have it, negative means you don't. So, now kind of jumping back to the composition of blood, we'll talk about blood plasma. So plasma is the liquid part, so that's what's used to transport the substances that are in the blood. Um, and that's So that's the liquid part, which is just minus the formed elements, the liquid part of it. So the composition, mainly it's made out of water. If you remember from looking at that little test tube in the beginning, it was 91% water. Um, and then it just has some little dissolved substances in it. And those are things like oxygen, proteins, antibody, clotting factors. Those are just some little substances that are dissolved in it. Um, and then in the plasma, there are also formed elements. These are things like your red blood cells, your white blood cells, and your platelets or your thrombocytes. So, those formed elements are normally formed in your bone marrow, that red bone marrow, if you remember from um, talking about the skeletal system. And that's where all of those blood cells are formed, um, except some of your lymphocytes and monocytes, which are formed in a few other places. But for the most part, those blood cells are formed in your bone marrow. Um, most of your other cells are, are formed in your lymphatic tissue, your lymph nodes, your thalamus, your spleen. Um, and blood diseases actually happen from a failure, most of the time at least, from a failure in your bone marrow or um, in your lymphatic tissue. And that can be from a few different causes, things like toxic chemicals that um, your bone marrow is exposed to or radiation or there can be inherited diseases or um, nutritional deficiencies or cancer like leukemia that all affect how either your bone marrow or your lymphatic tissue make those blood cells. So if bone marrow is suspected to be the cause, what they'll actually do is they'll do a biopsy. They'll actually aspirate a little bit of that bone marrow out with, I know it's a little scary, a great big needle that they stick into your bone and aspirate something up out of it. Um, Normally they use either your pelvic bone, which is the most common, or sometimes your sternum to just aspirate or suck out. Aspirate means that they're sucking out a little bit of, of the tissue there so that they can then study it. And what that does is that allows them to examine the tissue and look for, um, look at how it's structured to either see if your bone marrow is the, is the problem. Um, and if it is, they can use bone marrow or corn blood, a cord blood or um, a stem cell transplant can actually be used to try to replace some of that diseased or destroyed marrow so that you can start making better blood cells again. So red blood cells or erythrocytes. These are your most common type of blood cells and they're um, the principal means in the body of delivering oxygen to body tissues. Now, they don't last forever. Red blood cells have a very limited lifespan, only about 120 days. Red blood cells are also filled with hemoglobin, which is what makes them red. It's red pigmented. Um, 
and they are also containing the elements of iron and folate and the vitamin B12. And these are really crucial nutrients that the body needs to, fac um, to manufacture these red blood cells because they contain them. So if your diet is very poor and you don't have enough iron and B vitamins, you're not going to be able to produce good red blood cells, which means you're then not going to be able to um, oxygenate your tissues very well because you just don't have those red trucks. A lot of the time red blood cells are called the red trucks because their their main source is just to transport that oxygen. So if I don't have that nutrients, those nutrients, I can't transport the oxygen around the body where I need it to go. So um, your red blood cells, they are surrounded by a very tough, flexible plasma membrane that allows them to adapt and fit into narrow capillaries It's because they can kind of shrink down and squish in and still keep moving. They also, as you can see by this picture here, have kind of that donut caved in center um, of their disc shape and that just gives them a greater surface area to let them um, take in more oxygen and then deliver more oxygen. So hemoglobin, like we said before, hemoglobin is an essential part of your red blood cell and that's the part that carries the oxygen from your lungs to your body tissue. When it gets there, it actually releases the oxygen, collects up the carbon dioxide, and then transports it back to the lungs so that it can be exhaled. So that hemoglobin is really that transport system. So it carries the oxygen from your lungs to your tissues, so your tissues can use it. When your tissues use the oxygen, they actually then end up using carbon dioxide as the byproduct, and then they transport the carbon dioxide back to your lungs so that it can be exhaled out of the body. So normal blood normally has this nice mix. Remember from before 55% plasma, 45% formed elements. Um, and then there's just this little bit here that's the white blood cells and the platelets. It's really not very much um, compared to how much red blood cells and how much plasma there is. So that would be like what a normal test tube would look like if it was separated out. Now anemia. Anemia is when you have a low red blood cell count. So you can see here how low that blood cell count is. Or you can have a polycythemia. So remember, poly means a lot or many, multiple, more than one, that kind of thing. So here poly means a whole lot of red blood cells. So you can see where in this test tube that means a whole lot of them. So what does that all mean? Well, polycythemia is when there's a dramatic increase in the red blood cell numbers, and that is generally um, caused by a cancerous transformation of your red bone marrow, which means that you're making too much red blood cells. So some signs and symptoms of that. So what it does is it's going to increase your blood viscosity or the thickness of your blood, which is going to slow it down. It can't move as well because it's going to go super slow. It doesn't move very well. Um, and that's going to lead co to coagulation problems because slow blood is going to coagulate or clot. Um, the other thing that can happen is that there can be frequent hemorrhages. It's because there's a clot or there's backup of blood or it's super thick and hard to move. So it makes them actually easier to kind of bleed at the same time. They are um, more likely to, to distend blood vessels because of those coagulation problems and just pressing on them because of how thick that blood is. And then sometimes if they're distended too much, too far, too long, it can actually cause them to rupture and then hemorrhage. So like we said that hemorrhages, distended blood vessels, and also because it's super, super thick and kind of pressing out on those blood cells all the time, it's going to increase their blood pressure. So their blood pressure is going to be high. Hypertension is another um, sign of, of polycythemia. So what do we do about it? Well, one of the things we can do is we can do um, radiation or chemotherapy to try to suppress whatever that cancerous cell is that is causing um, too much red blood cells to be produced. So then the opposite end of the spectrum, anemia. Anemia is caused by um, very low numbers of red blood cells or abnormal red blood cells so that they're defective or there's not enough of them. 
some of the major clinical signs of this you can think about. If you just think about, um, so red blood cells, their main function is to transport oxygen. So if you have anemia, you're not going to be transporting enough oxygen, right? So that means that your symptoms, what you see, is really related to those low oxygen levels. So you're fatigued because you can't oxygenate your tissues. Your skin has kind of a very pale or dusky bluish look to it because you don't have enough red blood cells there. It's not that lack of oxygenated red blood cells is kind of giving your, your skin that pale look because it's lost that pale or that red color to it. You're very weak because that lack of oxygen is making your muscles fatigued and unable to work. You feel faint because your brain doesn't get enough oxygen. You get headaches because your brain doesn't get enough oxygen. And your heart rate and your respiratory rates are actually going to go up. And that's because they're trying to compensate for that low um, that, that low level of, of hemoglobin. So your heart's trying to pump faster to just circulate what you have more. And your respiratory rate's going up to try to just take in more oxygen. So they're trying to, to actually feed everything with less resources, which means it has to make work overtime. Kind of like if you're at work and somebody's out sick. Maybe you have to work extra shifts or work longer or work harder or take on some of their responsibilities because now you have to make up for what's lost. Same thing. If you're down some um, red blood cells, kind of still have to make up for that work because your body still has the same demands. Your body doesn't care that you don't have as many red blood cells. It has the same demands for you. So there are a few different types of anemia. There's hemorrhagic anemia. Hemorrhagic anemia is when there is an acute blood loss. So it's an um, it's like an immediate thing, like surgery or trauma. All of a sudden you've lost your blood loss. Or it can be a chronic blood loss, which would be like a gastric ulcer that's slowly bleeding over time. So you keep losing your blood slowly over time. And this can be treated with a blood transfusion, though a blood transfusion is really um, only temporary. It's not going to long-term increase uh, your, your blood cell levels unless you stop the problem. So if I give you blood but you're still bleeding, you're going to just be anemic again. Um, and that's why besides just the blood transfusion, you also have to treat whatever the underlying cause is. Another type of anemia is aplastic anemia, and that's characterized by low red blood cell numbers um, and the destruction of bone marrow. That's normally caused by a toxic chemical such as mercury or if you had radiation or certain drugs. Actually, um, they cause your, your bone marrow to be destroyed so you can't make any more and the low red blood cells. So it's like killing your red blood cells and it's not letting you make more. Um, so acute cases, very, very serious and have a very high death rate because remember those red blood cells are transporting your oxygen. So now not only do you have that low red blood cell count, but we're damaging the part of your body that makes red blood cells. So um, there's a very high death rate up to 70% with just a few months after diagnosis. And um, the way that you can treat this is with a bone marrow replacement or um, stem cell transplant, something that's going to try to replace that damaged bone marrow. And occasionally, if the cause is something like mercury, you can do chelating therapy, and that's when you actually give them a, a drug that will bind with whatever the toxic chemical is in hopes that it solves the problem. But unless that is the specific problem, that, that type of therapy won't actually be successful. So something else that you can have is that you can have a deficiency anemia. Deficiency anemia is caused by inadequate supply of the substances that you need to make red blood cells or hemoglobin. So we touched on this briefly. Remember how we talked about how um, your red blood cells need folate and B12 and iron. So if you have a low amount of those in your, um, in your diet, you're eventually going to end up with anemia. And that's because that malnutrition or a malabsorption of it um, just doesn't let your red blood cells either make enough of them or maybe they make enough of them, but they don't work correctly. So that normally requires some nutritional supplementation to fix. Um, and you can have hemolytic anemias. I know a whole lot of different types of anemias, right? Hemolytic anemias are caused by a decrease in the red blood cell lifespan 
or an increase in the red blood cell rate of destruction. So remember how we said that normally red blood cells have a 120 day lifespan. Um, so if their lifespan is shortened or if I, I like kill them off faster, now there's a low level of them because I'm, I'm taking them away faster than I'm producing them. So um, normally in this case, the red blood cells are distorted or they're easily broken. And the symptoms from this are jaundice and swelling of the spleen. And that's because you get that from um, the, the byproducts of that, those red blood cells being destroyed faster than the body can handle. So your spleen swelling because they're being destroyed there and the jaundice is the byproduct of them being destroyed. You can make gallstones, which are because you're kind of making too many for your body to handle and clear out well. So they actually start forming gallstones. And then you can get tissue iron deposits because that iron that's taken out of the red blood cells kind of gets put somewhere. So now it's going to be deposited in, in your tissues. Um, and and that's those are all just, like I said, in, in relation to retaining like the components of the red blood cells when they get broken down because they're being broken down faster than they normally would. So now we're retaining more of those breakdown products than we would on, on average, I mean. So um, a specific type of a hemolytic anemia would be sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disease which results in the... Um, formation of these abnormally shaped hemoglobins and it seems to be primarily in the black race that this happens. Basically what happens is that the red blood cells become fragile. They assume this sickle shape um, and so what happens is that it, it causes the blood oxygen levels to decrease. So remember how normally there were that nice round donut shape with very large surface areas? Well, these sickle shaped red blood cells have a much smaller surface area. They're going to have a lot less oxygen. Um, so what happens is that you can have sickle cell trait. Sickle cell trait means that you only have one of the sickle cell diseases or one of the sickle cell genes, sorry. Um, and normally these people are asymptomatic because they only have one, it's very, very mild. Or they can have sickle cell disease, which means that they have two defective genes. So I know that someone's probably thinking, well, why would you do that? But really, if you have sickle cell and you're totally asymptomatic, you don't know that you have it. So you might actually have a child with someone who also has sickle cell trait and doesn't know that they have it and produce children that have the whole disease. Now what happens when, when someone has sickle cell disease is it's much more serious. They actually have a reduction in blood flow and that's because those sickle shaped um, red blood cells, besides the fact that they're not carrying around as much oxygen, actually kind of stick together. They don't flow very well. They don't fit very well through capillaries. They're, that crescent shape makes them really stick together pretty easily, um, which means that they can actually go into what's called sickle cell crisis. Sickle cell crisis occurs um, and, and can be fatal, and that's when there's actually the pooling of blood cells. A lot of the time it's in the liver. It kind of gets backed up and pools in the body. It can actually be fatal and kill someone. So this is a picture of the sickle cell, um, red blood cells. So you can see like there's this little part of it that kind of looks normal. And then it's just kind of like this flat semicircle shape going on on that side. So you can see where that has a lot less surface area. And because of the shape, they're going to really get sticky and clump together and, and create blood to backflow. So. Moving forward, away from the sickle cell, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the RH thing that I that I mentioned earlier. And I know I said that I that we would do it again, and I was getting um, a little bit ahead of myself, and I was. Um, so the the disease when um, the you have an RH negative mom. Remember, mom has to be RH negative when she's carrying her second RH positive fetus. Can actually develop. Um, erythroblastosis fatalis. So what that means is that remember mom is negative, baby is positive, and she has to have two RH positive babies. So the first one, because remember she doesn't have antibodies to begin with, so she carries the first one. A little bit of their blood mixes, she gets some of those RH positive 
um, antigens in her system, so she starts forming antibodies against them. So she doesn't have the antibodies until she has that first baby. So then the second baby comes around, and by that second baby, she already has the antibodies. So her body immediately notices those antigens that are on it and attacks them. So um, the mom, like we said, makes those antibodies during her first pregnancy. In the second pregnancy, they're going to cross the placenta because remember, mom and baby share a circulatory system, and they actually attack baby's red blood cells. So what happens is the developing fetus um, has a decline in their own red blood cell numbers and their own hemoglobin le levels, so the baby becomes jaundice because it's destroying them, and um, one of the byproducts of of destroying red blood cells actually creates jaundice. So, well, what is jaundice? In case you don't know, it's that like yellow tinge in the in the skin. It gives makes people look kind of yellow. Um, so jaundice it can also cause intravascular coagulation because remember what happens when we mix um, antigens and antibodies, things that don't mix, it causes that agglutination of your red blood cells, which makes them all stick together. So now we have the, the sticking together of red blood cells in the baby, which causes that intervascular coagulation. And oftentimes it can cause heart and lung damage because um, baby's body isn't getting oxygenated like it should. And we're getting that intervascular coagulation and cutting off circulations to certain areas. This um, can even cause um, fetal death. So you might have a stillborn or a miscarriage as a result of this. So what do we do about it? Well, RH negative moms are actually given an injection of what's called Rogam. Rogam is a protein that actually prevents her from forming the antibodies. So normally if you have an RH negative mom, just as a precaution, she's going to get Rogam. She's going to get it um, kind of partway through her pregnancy and then again normally at birth just to make sure that she doesn't form those antibodies because we don't want her to, if she has another baby, to have her red blood cells attack baby's red blood cells. So here's a picture just to show you. So this is the first one where so baby's positive, mom is negative. Some of their blood cells are going to mix because they share that circulatory system. So what happens is mom forms these little antibodies. So then the next baby the mom has its Rh positive, so remember second Rh positive baby. Her antibodies are going to flow into baby and attack baby. Or attack baby's red blood cells, I should say. So now, time to move away from the red blood cells. We're going to talk about white blood cells. So with white blood cells, um, these are the cells of your immune system. They're involved in defending the body from infectious and foreign materials. Um, and, and you can also have, just like you can have too much or too little red blood cells, you can have too much or too little white blood cells. So you can have leukopenia. Leukopenia is an abnormally low white blood cell count. This normally occurs pretty infrequently, and normally this happens because there's a malfunction of the um, blood-forming tissues or a disease that happens to affect your immune system, something like AIDS. Um, or you can have leukocytosis, which is an abnormally high white blood cell count. This is what you would see in someone who's like fighting off a bacterial infection. They're going to have a high white blood cell count. Um, or it's a, also a classic sign of some blood cell cancers, um, like leukemia. So, white blood cell cancers. Well, you can have um, lymphoid neoplasms, and those are a result from B and T lymphocyte precursor cells. No, I don't really expect you to know all the details here. I really just want you to know that there are white blood cell cancers at this point, or at least for what's the information on this page. Um, or you can have myeloid neoblastomas, and that's from a result of malignant transformation of those precursor cells. Um, there's also multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma is the most deadly type of blood cancer in people over 65. Um, and this causes the, the bone marrow dysfunction. So remember how we talked about bone marrow dysfunction being pretty significant? So this bone marrow dysfunction causes um, 
a production deficit of antibodies. So I do expect you guys to know multiple myeloma, and that's just because it's the most deadly form. So it's a good one to at least know the name of and know that. So multi um, multiple myeloma is characterized first by recurrent infections and by anemia, because remember that our um, bone marrow is being destroyed. So not only are we having a problem making our white blood cells, but if our bone marrow is destroyed, we're also not going to make the proper amount of red blood cells either. Um, and now because that internal part of our bones um, is being destroyed, it's also going to weaken our bones and make them more likely to get fractured or damaged as well. So how do we treat it? Well, we treat it with chemotherapy. We can treat it with drugs. We're going to give people antibody therapy if they're having all those recurrent infections and we want to fight them off. And we can also do a marrow or a stem cell transplant. So the other really common um, blood cell cancers would be leukemias. And these are white blood cell related blood cancers. And they are characterized by marked leukocytosis. So remember leukocytosis means a whole lot of white blood cells. And they are, are classified as either acute or chronic. So acute, anything that's acute is rapid. Anything that's chronic is slow. Um, and then either lymphoid or myeloid. So let's start by talking about chronic um, lymphocytic leukemia, so CLL. So CLL normally happens um, in the older adult. It's very rare under the age of 30. Um, happens more frequently in men than women. And it's often the diagnosis is really um, happens unexpectedly on a routine physical exam because um, there's a, a change in their white blood cell count if they do lab work. And then the reason why it's normally unexpected is because the symptoms are normally very mild. They have some mild anemia and fatigue. Sometimes they have some um, enlarged, very painless lymph nodes, very vague, mild symptoms. So it's very hard to pin down. Um, and most people live for many, many years after the diagnosis. If they have a severe case, they might need treatment. And in that case, they would get chemotherapy or radiation. That's just a picture of what the um, CLL looks like. So um, where you can have CLL, chronic, you can also have the acute form, so acute lymphocytic leukemia. Um, ALL is the one that normally happens in children. So this normally occurs in children um, between the ages of 3 and 7, and 80% of the kids who get leukemia, this is the form that they get. The good news is about this is that it's very highly curable in children. Sadly, while it's highly curable in children, not so curable in adults. Um, Normally, the onset of it is very sudden. It's marked by a fever. Um, they get leukocytosis, so very high white blood cell count. Normally, they have some intense bone pain um, and an increased rate of infection. Um, normally, their lymph nodes and their spleen and their liver are enlarged, and that's because those are all organs that are related to your immune system, and they all become enlarged because they're working overtime. And treatment for this is normally chemotherapy, radiation, um, bone marrow, and stem cell transplants. And like we said, um, normally comes on very suddenly, acute suddenly. And this is the one that happens most of the time in kids. So good thing because it's very highly curable in children. So it's just a picture of what it looks like if you were to look at it under a slide. So chronic myeloid leukemia, so we're doing chronic acute, chronic acute. Um, so this is the one that normally happens in young adults, happens in adults normally between the ages of 25 and 60. The onset is, um, and progression is very, very slow. Normally it's just symptoms of fatigue and weight loss and weakness, which, you know, sounds a lot like most of the adults maybe that are just under a whole lot of stress and really busy with work. I mean, I can say I've definitely had times in my life where I was fatigued and just lost weight because I just didn't have time or energy to eat, became very weak, but this is different because this is a leukemia. Um, so the diagnosis is normally made kind of like the other one where it's just a, a routine physical exam and they find some changes on your blood work. Um, 
And, and not only that, but if they assess you, you have some extreme spleen enlargement, and that's because your spleen's working overtime for you. And normally the treatment for that is um, chemotherapy and radiation um, and potentially a bone marrow transplant if it's a more severe case. And that would be what it looks like. So then we can have acute myeloid leukemia. Um, so this accounts for 80% of all cases in adults. So AML is the most common case that adults have. And it's the remaining 20% in cases for children. Um, so the difference with ALL is it's very acute, which means it happens very suddenly. And it's also very rapid. So the symptoms are normally leukocytosis, leukocytosis, high white blood cell count, fatigue. Pretty much all of these are going to cause fatigue. Um, both acute cases cause some bone pain. Um, normally, they're very spongy, bleeding gums and anemia. They get these recurrent infections. Um, prognosis is really very poor if you get diagnosed with this type of leukemia. There's only about a 50% long-term survival in kids and only a 30% um, in adults. Normally, the treatment for this is a bone marrow or stem cell transplant. And that has increased the cure rate in um, selected patients, though that long-term prognosis is still very, very poor for um, acute myeloid leukemia. So what I want you to remember about these, I'm not going to ask you to remember too much. Um, I want you to know that acute myeloid leukemia is the most common and the most deadly. I also expect you to know that if it's chronic, happens slowly, probably not going to kill you. If it's acute, happens quickly, far more severe. Um, so I expect you to know um, chronic, much more mild. If we go back here, so acute lymphocytic, common one in kids, highly curable. Oops, went too far, right? Going in the wrong direction. There we go. Um, and that acute myeloid is the most common one in adults um, with a very poor prognosis. So, more white blood cell disorders. Let's cover mono. That's always a fun one because everyone probably heard about it, especially um, if you have kids or if you remember going to high school. Um, so, infectious mononucleosis, more commonly called as mono or the kissing disease. Um, this is a non-cancerous white blood cell disorder, um, and it's actually a virus that is transmitted in saliva. Normally, the highest incident is transmitted between the ages of 15 and 25, and that's because these are the ages when kids are in school. So they call it the kissing disease because it's transmitted in saliva. Does it have to be a kiss to transmit it? No. If I take a sip from a cup and I have mono and set it down, and then you take a sip from the cup, and you get a little bit of my saliva in your mouth, just from sharing a drink, you are exposed to mono. So really the incidence is high between the ages of 15 and 25, not because of all the kissing that happens, um, but just because of close proximity and you're more likely to just share all those germs because of that close proximity. So um, mono, what are the symptoms? Normally starts off with kind of like flu-like symptoms. There's a fever and fatigue and a sore throat and sometimes a rash. They get um, enlargement of their lymph nodes and of their spleen, and that's because those are part of your um, immune system, and so they're working overtime, so they become enlarged, and the fatigue, you're just utterly exhausted. Normally, the symptoms are pretty self-limiting, um, and those flu-like symptoms go away in, in, in four to six weeks, though the fatigue is really what lasts for a very, very long time. It may take a really, really long time to resolve um, significantly longer than the flu light symptoms actually get better. So now moving away from white blood cells, let's just cover some platelet disorders. So platelets and clotting disorders. So platelets. Platelets are an essential role in your blood clotting. So a blood vessel damage actually causes the platelets to become like sticky. They all stick together and form this little platelet plug, kind of like a little internal band-aid. Um, so the accumulated platelets actually then release these additional clotting factors that enter, um, cause your, your body to enter into this clotting cascade. 
So the platelets actually end up eventually becoming part of the clot, even though their initial initial response was really kind of just to like plug the hole. So um, things that can alter your blood clotting mechanism, the application of some sort of rust surface to the wound actually makes um, your platelets stickier and helps them release that clotting factor. That's why they say to hold something over it. The administration of vitamin K um, actually increases the synthesis of prothrombin. Prothrombin is one of your clotting factors. Vitamin K just makes you clot better. Um, and people are actually oftentimes given medications that delay your clotting. So those are things like Coumadin. Coumadin is a pill you can take at home that delays your clotting. Or Heparin. Heparin is given in the hospital as an IV form or a sub-Q injection. And that delays your clotting time. And those are normally given to people that are at risk for clotting. So um, like people that have had a stroke or some sort of blood clot oftentimes go home on some sort of anticoagulation and that's because they don't want that to happen again. So they're given some medicine to make their blood not clot so much. If you have a fib, which is a cardiac disorder that um, causes some, some stagnation of blood in your heart because of the way your um, heart chambers are contracting, oftentimes those people go home on some sort of anticoagulant because it's trying to decrease the amount of blood that's clotting in their heart so that they don't form a blood clot and get those complications. So vitamin K is going to help increase your clotting, but we can also give you medications that help delay your clotting. And that's one of those things where you have to kind of weigh the, the what's the greater evil. Is the risk for clotting worse or is the um, risk for bleeding worse in this particular person? What are their risk factors? So like I was just saying that Coumadin is one of those um, clot altering drugs so that inhibits prothrombin synthesis so you can counter Coumadin by giving someone vitamin K. Heparin. Heparin is an IV or a sub-Q. Sub-Q means that it's the little shot that you give someone in their skin. If you've ever seen somebody give themselves insulin, same, same idea. Um, just goes into your um, adipose layer below your dermis. Um, and that delays clotting by inhibiting the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. Um, and both of those are going to just make you make you not clot as fast. We can also give um, people a drug called um, tissue plasminogen activator or TPA and that's actually used to dissolve a clot that is already formed. So Coumadin and Heparin are going to make you not as likely to clot but they won't dissolve the clot. TPA actually dissolves a clot that is already formed. So there are two different types of blood clots. There's a thrombus. A thrombus is a stationary blood clot or an embolus. An embolus is one that's actually circulating around in your bloodstream. The embolus is the one that's more dangerous because it can lodge itself anywhere in your body, including, including in your heart or in your brain or in your lung. So it can actually cause a lot of damage. So this is someone with a pulmonary embolus. So that emboli, remember how the emboli is the circulating one, was circulating around in their blood system from wherever it happened to form until it hit a spot where it actually just couldn't go any further. The blood vessel got too small. Because see here where this is a really big blood vessel and then it splits. It makes two small blood vessels. Well, it wouldn't really fit. So it just plugged up both of them. So the problem with this is that now everything south here of this blood clot or everything further down is now not getting any blood. So we, if this is in the lung, it's now not able to pick up oxygen. But that part of the lung is also not getting circulation. So now you're circulating less oxygenated blood because we're cutting off part of the lung and you're destroying some of your lung tissue in the process as well. So more clotting disorders. Um, you can have hemophilia. Hemophilia is an X-linked disorder. Remember, we've talked about quite a few of these so far. X-linked means sex-linked. means it normally happens in boys because um, sadly they have the XY combination, not the XX, so they're much more likely to suffer from these X-linked disorders. And it's an inherited disorder. And basically what it is is that it's an inability to produce one of the plasma proteins that are responsible for blood clotting. So it's a very serious bleeding disease. Um, and type A is the most common. I don't expect you to know that. I just want you to know that hemophilia is a very serious bleeding disease. And it's characterized by easy 
um, by the, someone that's very easily bruised. Because if you remember, um, bruising is really just kind of bleeding a little bit beneath the skin from some damaged blood vessels. There can be deep muscle hemorrhages. So if I get hit in the leg, I might not only have a little bruise on my skin, but it actually might have ruptured some bigger blood vessels deeper in my muscle, and I could actually be hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging like um, massive bleeding. Um, there might be blood in my urine because almost anything will damage some of those blood vessels because I just bleed so easily. Um, and repeated episodes of bleeding into joints, which can, which can cause pain and can actually eventually cause joint deformity. Um, so we can treat this normally by administering um, factor eight. Factor eight is going to just help with your clotting. These people, you also want to do a lot of injury prevention. You want them to avoid dangerous activities that are much more likely to um, cause them to bleed. Um, and you want them to avoid any type of drug that might um, slow down their clotting, like aspirin. Aspirin um, kind of makes your platelets less sticky so that they don't clot as well, so they're not allowed to take aspirin. They're definitely not going to take things like heparin or Coumadin. We don't want to continue to slow it down their clotting mechanism or now they're really going to bleed to death. So then one more platelet disorder before we're done, and that's thrombocytopenia. So thrombocytopenia is caused by a um, reduced platelet count. So remember platelets, those formed that first little patch when there was an injury or some sort of bleeding happening. So it's characterized normally by the bleeding from small blood vessels. Normally this is most visible in your skin or in your mucous membranes. Um, the most common cause is some sort of bone marrow destruction, either by drugs or chemicals or a form of radiation or even a disease like cancer or lupus or AIDS. And treatment for this is a transfusion of platelets because we want to get them up. Um, or we can give them corticosteroid type drugs. These are things that are going to trigger the body to make more platelets. And that's because the, it's a stress hormone. When you're stressed, your body makes more platelets because if you happen to gouge your leg open while you're running from that bear, remember stress, stress hormone, fight or flight instinct, it wants you to clot faster so that you don't bleed to that. You can just keep running away. Um, and, and also by possibly removing the spleen if it's a very severe case, because um, the, the spleen is the site of that of um, your blood cell um, destruction. So if we take out your spleen, then you're not going to be able to destroy as many of them. So that takes us to the end of the blood lecture.